everyone that this meeting is being broadcast uh, live via the internet. Before we begin today's meeting, I'd like to announce the following appointments. Effective today, October 23rd, 2019, I am appointing Ricky Raven as chair of the Agency Operations Committee. Javed Anwar is vice chair of the Agency Operations Committee and Emma Swartz as a member of the Agency Operations Committee. In a moment, I'll hand the meeting to the new chair, but I'd first like to welcome our new board member, M Emma Swartz, and our new commissioner of higher education, Dr. Harrison Keller. Uh, Ms. Swartz and, 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 and Commissioner Keller will be formally introduced at tomorrow's meeting, uh, board meeting, but you, you want to say just briefly kind of a few words? Sure. Um, so I'm learning a lot. I'm very excited to be um, a member of this board and this committee. Um, I'm ex excited to see what impact we can have on the, the state of Texas higher education. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Emma. Commissioner? Uh, just to say, I'm, I, I'm, I'm excited to be the, the sixth commissioner of, of uh, higher education to work with, the, with, work with the board, work with the institutions in partnership with the governor and the legislature to advance uh, higher education of the state of Texas. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'll now hand the meeting over to our new chair, Ricky Raven. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, we will begin with uh, item number two on the agenda, um, is approval of the minutes from the July 24th, 2019 committee meeting. Uh, do I have a motion for approval of the July minutes? So moved. Uh, second. Uh, motion made by uh, Dr. Faria, second by the chairman, uh, Mr. Stedman. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing no opposition, motion passes. Uh, Item number three uh, on the agenda is public testimony on the is public testimony, and it's my understanding that we have not received any requests for for public testimony. So we'll move to the next item, uh, agency operations. Item number four uh, under 4A report on grants and contracts. This item does not require any action. Dr. Bill, uh, Mr. Bill Franz, I made your doctor already. Uh, General counsel is available for questions. Any questions for uh, Bill Franz? No questions? All right, well, thank you. Uh, next item B under four is update of the key initiatives recommended by AT&T Cybersecurity regarding the agency cybersecurity framework. This item does not require any action. Ms. Zen, Zen Sun, Assistant Commissioner for Information Solutions and Services and Chief Information Officer, and Mr. Peter Donton, Information Security Officer, will present this item to the committee and be available to answer any questions. Uh, Ms. Sun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board members. Before we start today's presentation, I'd like to take this opportunity to formally introduce our agency's new information security officer, Mr. Peter Downton. Peter came to the coordinating board from the Texas Veterans Commission. I'll let Peter introduce Excuse himself to the board. Sorry. I will, uh, I will let Peter introduce himself to the board and uh, tell you more about his background and experience. Thanks, Jin Jin Hao. As you said, my name is Peter Donton. Um, I've been with the state uh, for about seven years now. I started out with the Texas Medical Board as a, uh, a programmer uh, before moving on to the Texas Veterans Commission, uh, where I was the uh, lead developer for uh, migrating an application that the coordinating board used to have for the Hazelwood Act. And I was the lead developer for that and database administrator. Uh, shortly after that, I, I moved on to the role of uh, information resources manager and information security officer. And, um, and then recently, uh, starting September 1st, I moved on to here at Corning Board. I'm excited to be here, and uh, there are uh, interesting security challenges uh, for our agency that I am glad to, uh, to tackle on. Okay, so now we're going well, to start our... Well, Mr. Donton, thank you. We're, you know, we all uh, are constantly talking about cybersecurity. <laughs> it seems to be, you know, everywhere I go, my law firm, businesses, boards I serve on, Cybersecurity is, uh, is at the <coughs> forefront of everybody's mindset, so we welcome you and thank you for your service. Thanks. Ms. Sun. 
Yes. So during this presentation, first I will provide an overview on the agency's cybersecurity framework and then brief the board on the fiscal year 2019 assessment results. Then Peter will introduce the fiscal year 20 security initiatives implementation roadmap and provide everybody with a status report. So the core mission of the agency cybersecurity framework is to assess and improve our agency's ability to prevent, detect, and respond to cyber incidents. The framework uses business drivers to uh, guide cybersecurity activities and consider cybersecurity as part of the agency's overall risk management plan. The customized framework aims to meet our agency's unique business needs by taking its people, process, and technology into consideration. The IT Steering Committee, which is chaired by the Chief Operating Officer, provide a security governance to our agency over the security program. The security management is responsible for implementing the security program at the agency, and the security operations team is carrying out day-to-day -day security related activities. So as um, Mr. Raven mentioned, the security threat landscape is constantly changing and the bad actors have become much more creative and much more sophisticated in how they launch cyber attacks. S to stay nimble and proactive, one of the most important tasks performed by the security team is continuous security monitoring. So we have tools and sensors and processes built into our environment to provide real-time visibility into the agency's security posture. And the security team monitors for cyber threats, security misconfigurations, and any other potential vulnerabilities on a regular basis. Earlier this year, AT&T Cybersecurity conducted an assessment on the maturity level of the agency cybersecurity framework. At the July AOC meeting, the AT&T assessor presented the final report along with key recommendations to the board. The agency received an overall rating of three in terms of cybersecurity maturity, which means the agency has a documented, detailed approach to meeting the objective and regularly measures its compliance. <clears throat> this next slide shows a side-by-side -side comparison between the fiscal year 2017 and the fiscal year 2019 assessment results. During the 2019 assessment, 16 control objectives received higher maturity scores. 36 of the 40 standard control objectives implemented at the coordinating board received a maturity score higher than the state agency average. Uh, Ms. Sun, when did you yes. start in your position? Uh, I started back in 2013, late 2013. Yeah, but you, you became head of... I became the CIO in uh, May uh, 2017. Anyway, Commissioner, do you notice the, the correlation there? <laughs> 16 <laughs> going from a level 2 to, to, to level uh, 3, that's, that's really good work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stedman. So at the July AOC meeting, the board expressed very strong support for the agency to implement all the key recommendations to improve the agency's security posture. For us to move to a maturity level of four, the security team will need to establish a formal risk management framework to measure and evaluate risk based on the agency's risk tolerance and continue to integrate improvements beyond the requirements of the applicable regulations. New policies and user training will be introduced to ensure consistent data classification, especially for unstructured data. And we will implement a technical solutions for data classification and integrate all these data classification with the existing agency data loss prevention program. So for me, um, I want to uh, describe while well, looking forward what our security program is uh, uh, intend to do. Uh, our information security program must continuously adopt with the evolving threats that put our put at risk uh, the confidentiality, integrity, and um, availability of our information resources. The uh, fiscal year 20 security initiatives implementation roadmap identify relevant and actionable priorities to strengthen the security posture of the coordinating board. The roadmap is based on the recommendations of the biennial assessment reports, as Jin Jin pointed out, uh, agency business goals, and, um, and also available resources that we have to work with. Uh, these priorities are a mix of uh, both technical and administrative controls. Uh, their effectiveness, of course, requires uh, support of agency leadership uh, from all levels. 
Um, looking forward, the most important technical control the roadmap prioritizes is the implementation of multi-factor authentication. Um, this will protect our cloud-based resources, such as email systems and document repositories in SharePoint and our OneDrive folders. The plan is to have multi-factor authentication deployed for Office 365 resources by the end of the first quarter. Um, perhaps the most important uh, administrative control that we can, uh, uh, we can do, as uh, Jeanine alluded to, is the uh, implementation of a risk analysis, risk analysis and management framework. A robust uh, risk uh, management enabled the information security program to both effectively communicate the potential impacts of threats and to uh, provide objective basis for uh, resource management. The goal is to have information security risk management policies reviewed and procedures implemented by the fourth quarter. Cybersecurity and privacy incident response is an important priority. Uh, the information security program is partnering with stakeholders of the continuity of operations plan. Specifically, policies and procedures are being reviewed uh, for responding to cybersecurity incidents that impact the agency's ability to deliver on its critical business functions. A tabletop exercise is in initial stages of planning uh, for the fourth quarter of this fiscal year. Presently, uh, we are working to emplace continuous security monitoring tools. Uh, we will be the first agency in the, uh, in the data center, Texas data center, to, uh, to emplace a uh, web application filter. Um, upon successful completion, uh, we estimate around the third quarter of, the, of this fiscal year. Uh, IT operations and continuous improvements, de continuous improvement department have recently begun using a change management process in response to a, to a recommendation of the biennial assessment report. And this is, uh, this is a process that, that we have to have in place to, uh, to monitor and to, uh, to make sure that changes within our systems are, um, are properly vetted and assessed for risk. Now, finally, we are in the final stages of clearing our technical hur hurdles to implementing multi-factor authentication for Office 365 uh, resources. Um, I've always said that if there's one thing I can get done here is to implement multi-factor for our Office 365 resources because uh, more and more, uh, more and more of our uh, employees are using it, not just from when they are here in the office, but also when they are away from the office. The information security program is staffed with an ISO and an information security analyst. Um, our request for additional analysts uh, was denied last year, but uh, to, uh, to, uh, to help ourselves, uh, we have uh, allocated around 100 hours of uh, staff hours from, uh, from, I from other ISS departments to help out with uh, security-specific tasks. Uh, most importantly, um, I ask for your support of our information security program. Together, we can take it to the next maturity level and preparedness. Thank you. It I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Sun. Uh, I was going to ask Peter, do you want to quickly mention uh, this slide, you know, uh, based on the uh, implementation roadmap, but this is what we project the maturity level of yes, the sir. selected uh, countries. Sorry, I, I think I've but, skipped on that one. <laughs> <that's> <laughs> A little fine. nervous. Yeah. Um, so this slide you see here, sir, is the, uh, our projected, our, our goal. So you can see there FY20, as Jean mentioned, uh, the AT&T uh, assessment done uh, back in uh, uh, June, July, mm -hmm. uh, assessed us to be a level of three. And our goal is to move us up to, the, uh, to, to a level of four. And what that, brief, uh, what that essentially means is a, a three level is means that you've identified security controls uh, for, uh, for, uh, for certain uh, security objectives. Um, and then uh, and for each of those, there are control areas. And, and these are the areas that we hope to, uh, to improve on uh, for, for the current fiscal year. Uh, to lay that out a little bit more specifically, uh, you can see here that in the Q1, we help to achieve uh, access control. And what that means specifically is uh, and the implementation of MFA for Office 365 uh, uh, resources. Also, um, the continuous uh, security monitoring, uh, we are continuing our work on that one, but as well, uh, the risk analysis framework, uh, as I mentioned in my prepared remarks, the two, three of the most important things that we could get done. Uh, Ongoing, of course, is a policy procedure and, and enhancement. Um, as we find uh, 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 gaps in, in how we're doing business uh, from a security perspective, we review policies and, and, and uh, update them as, as needed. Any questions? Mr. Chairman? Um, okay, so, so We'll go back a slide. I, I, didn't, I don't really understand all of that, but if 
this one? It, the multi-factor authentication, does that alone move you from three to four in all these areas? No, 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 sir. Not, okay. not, well, not in well, all those my, areas. My real question is, do we have the resources to do this? As, as I recall in that meeting with the consultants, um, it, it, it was difficult. I mean, a four is a pretty high score, and, and so do we have the resources, and is this realistic? Right. Yeah, yes, sir, it, it is ambitious, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but uh, by, by uh, breaking down the smaller uh, pieces, I think uh, we have a good shot at, at at least achieving some things. So the planning process is also based on our current staffing level and budget. So I will go to the slide, you know, where it shows budget and staffing. So based on the budget allocated for the fiscal year 2020 and the staffing level, and also collaboration from the different ISS department, this is our projection. If we implement all these initiatives, this is what we will see by the end of fiscal year 2020. Any other questions? Are there other initiatives that you're not able to achieve um, that are not listed here with the current uh, resources you have? Yeah, so this list, uh, you know, we select 18, approxi approximately 18 objectives, you know, to uh, raise the maturity level, but there are 40 standard controls. You know, we wish, you know, we could have the capacity to work on all of them at the same time, you know. So uh, to answer your question, yes, you know, there are other initiatives, you know, we will have to postpone to fiscal year 2021. And also, you know, we tie these initiatives to the agency business priorities. So these are not standalone. So security initiatives. We're also trying to um, tie these initiatives into uh, new implementation, new services we're trying to implement in our environment. I had a question uh, for either of you. When do, when do you know that your framework is, is out of date? I mean, how do you... Yes, sir. Uh, so the framework itself is, uh, is uh, more or less directed by uh, Department of Information Resources. Uh, it is it is derived it, it is actually mentioned in statute that they would uh, come up with a framework and so the framework itself is based on the NIST uh, uh, framework it's a broader um, a broader uh, framework uh, used uh, by, by by federal agencies and so our our framework is, is based on that one um, it's it's pretty uh, it, it does evolve uh, over time for example uh, when I first started as an ISO there was only 40 security controls but now there are 46 that's that's being required. So from time to time, uh, our uh, uh, DIR does update it to uh, to meet uh, evolving uh, threats. Any other questions, Ms. Sun, Mr. Dunn? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Item five on the uh, agenda: finance. <clears throat> uh, the first item on the finance is agenda five A: review of the fiscal year 2019 financial report. To the board, this uh, item does not require any action. Uh, Mr. Ken Martin, Assistant Commissioner for Financial Services and Chief Financial Officer, will present this item to the committee and be available to answer any questions. Mr. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members, and welcome our new member and renew member. This item is uh, presented quarterly to the board. It's basically a, a financial report, but more related to the budget aspect of the agency and, and what transpires. And I will provide a little bit more detail in this review. One, it's for fiscal year 2019, which uh, started September 1st, 2018, and runs through August 31st, 2019. Uh, in the January board meeting, we will present begin presenting fiscal year 2020 information in this report. This report was developed for the board based on input uh, from the board over time. We've continued to modify the report based on feedback we've received. We've included loan program information, uh, programmatic information. It is a summary of the report. I will go through a, a PowerPoint summary. You all have the report, but if you have any specific questions about the report, I'm happy to go in there. We can bring that up, present, and, and have any other uh, detailed discussions if you'd like. With that said, um, our total budget was approximately $1.7 billion. And if you recall, at July, we came to the board for approval for the two, fiscal year 2020 budget. This item was based on the 86 legislature and the General Appropriations Act, the conference committee specifically. 
And with that, the board starts from that approval, we start with what I'll call our, our base budget, mm -hmm. and we start the year. Within the report, we include budget adjustments. So anytime within fiscal year 19, uh, an appropriation change is made, we move from one appropriation to another, or we receive new money, such as federal or donated money from outside, other grants, et cetera, you'll see a budget adjustment, an increase or a decrease, et cetera. That's disclosure to the board in this report every quarter of what other activities and adjustments we've made from the original budget that was approved uh, previously. So our budget starts at $1.7 billion. Our trust deed, or what I call the programmatic funds, break down to almost $740 million. Our operating administrative is around $32 million, and our community college funding was around $900 million. Within this report, we also include the loan portfolio. So in the General Appropriations Act, the only item for related to the loan program that's included in there is the administrative cost. So approximately 15, 14 million dollars is appropriate in the General Appropriations Act, but the activity regarding the bonds, the loans, loans are actually receivables, not expenditures, not to make everybody accountants, but from that standpoint, they're not reflected in the General Appropriations Act. We will talk a little bit about that more in detail with our next uh, agenda item. So I won't in great detail on the loan program yet, but we have $1.5 billion outstanding, of which the majority are college access loans at $1.3 billion. We do have our Beyond Time program, which is being phased out since uh, 2015 legislature, and we have a couple other smaller programs in there. One of the other active program, loan program is a Texas Armed Services Scholarship Program. Total expended was $1.66 billion. And total dispersed from a loan program standpoint was almost $160 million, which was approximately a six, point, a six percentage increase year over year. Loan payment revenue was almost $55 million, and almost a 5% increase. So those are the payments once we issue a loan, the borrowers are, are paying us back. And that's very important for us to be able to pay our debt, the bonds that we issued to fund those initial loans. Proceeds last year from bond sales were almost $340 million. As, as some of the board members know, we had about $170 million of what I call new money bonds. These were to fund the loans for this fiscal year, as well as we had almost $170 million that we uh, refinanced in of old bonds. So we restructured our debt portfolio. It needed to be rebalanced, but also we wanted to capture interest savings and, and take advantage of market conditions as best we could. We had about $50 million of savings cash flow savings uh, futures by lowering our debt service over that time. So that will help the program, one, strengthen the program, balance the incoming cash flows and our, and our debt outflows better or, throughout each year. As you know, we have the Office of uh, Attorney General that helps us with our default collections. So we'll work the delinquency in our loan servicing program when somebody uh, is paying us late, but once they're about six months late, it gets transferred over to the Office of Attorney General for them to uh, uh, begin starting the collection process, working with the individual, if we can get repayments, any type of uh, uh, income base type of uh, uh, payment program, we, we'll work with them in many different ways. But their collections were around $13.6 million, of which was a 9% increase. So it continues to, to uh, be very beneficial, this partnership with the Office of Attorney General. Our current interest rate of 5.2%, that at the time when we set it, I believe is around May, uh, was only about 30 basis points higher than the federal uh, subsidized rate. The feds had a sale and, and reset the interest rate down to 4.53, so it gives you a little bit of, of scale. We issue tax-exempt bonds. That does allow us to take advantage of, of interest rates from a bonding standpoint about as low as you can get. We leverage the state's AAA rating because we, these are general obligation backed by the state. And a uh, the, the couple items regarding programs to note out. The Math and Science Scholarship Loan Repayment Program was a new program in fiscal year 18-19, came out of the previous legislative session, and we lapsed $1.7 million. The, the program, the first year of adoption, we only received 11 applications. It uh, had pretty stringent uh, GPA and other requirements. This is a program basically to try and get individuals that have a math or a certain type of science uh, degree program to go into teaching. And it had a 3.5 GPA requirement. 
and as you know with the industry and, and the market conditions today and about a 3.7, 3.6% unemployment rate in, in Texas, somebody with that is, is very marketable on the, on the private sector. So uh, we worked with legislature to try and make adjustments. It was adjusted down to 3.0. 3, uh, we'll see, uh, we haven't realized or been able to see how that'll impact this year, but we're hopeful that we'll get a, a little more adoption. We don't know that'll make that program fully subscribed, but hopefully we'll get a little more adoption out of it. We also have the graduate medical education program. That's one of our, uh, probably our second largest program. And we had $1.7 million, it came in below budget. As you recall, that program is funded by general revenue and also money from the permanent fund. So there was a graduate medical education permanent fund established of which there's a corpus that's invested at uh, Treasury Safekeeping Trust Company. It's an arm of the comptroller. And we draw down the earnings on that, which is approximately $11.5 million. So really $1.7 million stayed in the corpus. So we didn't lose it. It'll just be utilized for future drawdowns and, and be able to generate future earnings. There, the issue there, as I understand it, was that some of the uh, uh, entities were not able to stand up the residencies as quick as they thought. So we had grants and had them out, but then they had to uh, return money because they weren't able to, to execute to the timing that they need to to get that residency. So hopefully this year, maybe they were able to stand up that residency and then uh, get that funding. Student Loan Administration was below approximately $900,000, million, or $900 and that basically was a result of uh, credit card fees. So we allow borrowers to make uh, payments to the loans, which was very much requested by many different borrowers to get us up to the 21st century, of which we did. And you, could, you can make your payment on Visa, MasterCard, et cetera. We were incurring those fees initially, so we were we were absorbing those credit card fees, and uh, part of last year we were able to transition where we dropped the interest rate. We offered a different package, so we started charging the fee, but we offered borrowers an alternative and said you can get a uh, 25 basis point or, or quarter point interest rate re reduction on your loan if you sign up for automatic ACH, automatic drafting of your checking, savings account, et cetera. So we did offer an alternative to say we're going to start charging the fee, but you can actually save money if you go to this alternative versus using your credit card. And that saved us around $900,000. And the Beyond Time Loan Program was under budget for the reasons we discussed. It's being phased out and, and the number of students eligible, they're just renewals, so there weren't as many renewals as anticipated. Most of those funds will go to the uh, uh, Beyond Time Fund and eventually based on legislature's determination, hopefully be returned back to institutions based on whatever methodology. The top 10% scholarship program, all of those funds lapse. So that fund program was also being phased out on the 2015 legislature, and this one we did not receive any requests. So we had in the prior years, this year we received zero requests. That program is essentially closed and, and done. So I'm happy to answer any questions, and again, you do have the uh, report and um, any other details I'm happy to provide. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I've got, if you can go back to page two, I think I've got a technical question. Uh, okay, so the community college, th that is TEOG plus formula. Actually, this community college, so TEOG, is in trustee programs. So Texas Grant, TEOG, TEG, all of our grant okay. programs are in trustee. Those are the programs that, that the coordinating board manages. This particular community college is what's appropriated to the community college on behalf of uh, legislature for the, the uh, which is the formula basically so, for us yeah, to my, distribute to the community Okay, college. so it's only formula, but that, so the distinction is on, on the university, the four-year universities, formula goes directly to them. That is correct. But the community colleges, it comes through us. And, and the rationale for that is that the four-year universities are public state entities, so money can go from the comptroller straight to that state entity as it does to us. Community colleges, though we think of them as public, they are not a state entity. So the money has to come to a state entity, the coordinating board, and then we're, we administer the funding over a 10-month program and distribute to the community colleges. And that makes sense to you? Never, never mind. Rhetorical, I hope. Any other questions for Mr. Martin? All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Martin. Now we'll move on to uh, uh, agenda item 5B, consideration of adopting a resolution authorizing the issuance of State of Texas College student loan bonds in one or more series. 
and delegation of the authority for administ administration and approval of the activities necessary to complete the sale of private activity bonds. We have with us Mr. Ken Martin, Assistant Commissioner for Financial Services and Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Richard Donahue, partner, McCall, Parkhurst, and Horton, and Mr. Lee Donner, Regional Managing Director, Hilltop Securities, Inc., will present this item to the committee and be available to answer any questions. Mr. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. This item, I come to the board every year. Uh, I'm happy to report with Senate Bill 1474 <coughs> passage, this really allowed us to uh, have greater flexibility in the timing of issuing bonds. But to provide a little bit of background, we have the College Access Loan Program, which as you saw is our, our most largest portion of our portfolio. We fund issuing loans to students by issuing bonds, debt, the proceeds from that debt get issued to students, and then over time those students repay us back. As they repay us back, that fund money goes to pay our debt and also administer uh, the loan program, all the servicing, origination, and the other items that we do. In this particular item, we are making a request for a resolution for two items. One is the standard annual new money bond issue. This will fund bonds for the following academic year. We are well funded for this fall and spring semester, but we need to start planning for next academic year. The good thing with the passage of that Senate bill is that we are planning on issuing these bonds in July. So we hope to go to market, hopefully in all, hopefully if all conditions continue to hold and we don't see any uh, significant changes in interest rates, we'll be able to take advantage of a low interest rate uh, environment and looking to go to market in July to fund start funding loans for August uh, and on that next academic year. We also are asking in the resolution the potential to refund, refinance the 2010 bond series that's outstanding and in August 31st of 2020 will become callable. Callable, we have a 10-year call provision. We'll issue bonds to be up to a 24-year period but we'll have a 10-year call provision. So it means that after 10 years, if you have any one of the bonds from years four through uh, nine, you're fine. After year 10, you're, you're the potentially subject to call based on interest rates and favorability of the market. Uh, assuming interest rates hold, it will be very favorable. The projections for a financial advisor right now based on current interest rates would be over a $20 million savings for uh, refinancing those bonds. So very favorable. You saw that we've already saved $50 million in our debt program. If we can add another $20 million in there, it helps us lower our debt. So that helps us have many different factors that we can do. We can lower interest rates or utilize more loans, um, make changes in administration, et cetera. So it just frees up more funding in the program, makes it more efficient. I'm happy to answer any questions. I do have uh, two representatives, Mr. Richard Donahue from Call Parkhurst and Horton. He represents us from a bond council standpoint, all uh, things legal. These are securities, so they are governed by Security Exchange Commission. We also, since they're tax exempt, have to meet IRS requirements to ensure that the bonds maintain that sta uh, tax exempt status. And then we have a myriad of state uh, uh, statute, statutorial requirements and administrative code requirements that we have to uh, make sure we adhere to. And Mr. Lee Donner is here from Hilltop Securities. He is here to represent us from financial advisory, all things market, market conditions, and we bounce uh, off thoughts and ideas and how we make uh, this portfolio more efficient, how we can reap more savings within the program to make it more efficient, more cost effective. So with that, I'll let Mr. Uh, Donner speak a little bit about market conditions and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Donahue. Thank you, uh, Mr. Martin, Mr. Chairman. A uh, couple brief comments on the, the proposed uh, refunding portion. As Mr. Martin has indicated, based on current market rates, and we reran the re refunding numbers late last week, the, um, 2010 bonds could be refunded um, at about a 21 million cash flow savings, um, 18 million net present value savings. That comes out to about 21% net present value savings. <clears throat> and for those of you not uh, that don't work in the municipal finance arena on a regular basis, 3% net present value savings is considered sort of the gold standard. If you can achieve 3% savings, you go for it. And here we're looking at uh, roughly seven times that amount. Now, again, that's based on current market rates. We've got 
uh, five, six, seven months between now and when uh, we would probably go to market based on uh, anticipated scheduling right now. But with a 21% net present value savings bogey out there, the market could move against you significantly and you could still execute a, a very good uh, refunding transaction. Market conditions right now uh, remain quite good and that would be true for both the new money uh, portion of what's in the resolution and the refunding. For those of you that are, are somewhat new to the board or the student loan process, I want to once again point out that the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board's student loan program is unique in the nation. There are uh, quite a number of state agency and state sponsored or supported 501c3 not-for-profit student loan programs around the country. and we're. We're financial advisor on roughly a dozen of those. The coordinating boards program is the only one in the country that has the state's general obligation pledge behind its bonds. It's the only state geo program out there. And the result is, of course, that you have a, a market attraction with that state geo, which, of course, currently brings AAA bond ratings with it that uh, make, make your offerings very attractive. To illustrate that, you're the only state agency student loan issuer in the country that does your bond offerings by competitive bid as opposed to a negotiated underwriting. In a negotiated underwriting, you hire an underwriter, bring them in, and they go out and pre-market the bonds and get the buyers all lined up and hopefully you have a successful pricing. Coordinating board does competitive bid. You structure your offerings. We work with bond council to put together a disclosure document. We put it out there. We put out a schedule, and on a specified day, anybody that's interested can bid. And generally, you will have anywhere from six to a dozen of the big uh, um, broker-dealer firms in the country bidding your bonds. You you get the best interest rate of any student loan issuer in the country. You still pay a slight premium on your bonds because the word student loan is included in there. And it doesn't matter that you're a state GO, that student loan uh, revenue bond or student loan bond uh, nomenclature is going to cost a couple basis points extra in interest rate. And that actually works in your favor in recent market conditions. There's not much spread between low-rated or non-rated bonds and AAA bonds. And so if you've got a AAA bond that's got a basis point or two additional yield in it because of the word student loans, the last couple of years, your, both your new money issues and your refundings have been what we call colloquially a food fight. Uh, the underwriters want to buy them and turn around and remarket them. So that's specific to you. General market conditions remain quite strong. We're in a net negative supply environment ever since the tax reform, the last tax reform act. Uh, you've got less municipal debt coming to market each year than you have running off and repaying. So negative net supply. On top of that, the uh, flows into the bond funds have been positive for Oh, over a year now. So conditions remain good. Uh, will they stay that way from now the time you go to market? No way to say. Uh, but the, you know, the, the betting right now is that you're going to see additional decreases in uh, Fed funds rate, which may trickle out into the longer term maturities, but we're just going to have to wait it out. There's nothing on the horizon that we can see right now that would um, cause me any heartburn about uh, bringing your transaction to market in the next summer. Any questions? Oh, Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Donahue, you have any? And, and if I may, one, one item. Uh, Mr. Donahue mentioned GEO or general obligation. So that is basically, it is required by statute that the comptroller basically back the program. So the state backs this program, though they never have had to, 
they would be required, if we fell short of our debt service obligation, we didn't have enough money to pay our debt, to step in and use general revenue, tax revenue, for the program. That would be a bad result. But luckily, as we've been working through on this and, and predecessors, the agency has a, a very well-funded program. We do not foresee that ever needing to happen. But from a sales standpoint, it makes us very marketable because an investor has some insurance, just like the federal government, they can just print more money. So you feel more better that, you know, buying a treasury uh, and they're typically lower than munis. But that's that's the geo. It gives us a little, a little bit of uh, backstop and gives us more advantage on, on market as well as leveraging the AAA uh, state rating because our we do have to have uh, rating agencies, S&P and Moody's typically rates us, and we go out and uh, have them do an analysis, but they're doing analysis of the loan program as well as the state, and the state has a rainy day fund, et cetera. So anyways, just give you a little bit of background, but that that is the power and the ability to leverage uh, low interest rate and grab uh, market conditions. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Richard Donahue from McCall Parkers and Horton. He represents us from Bond Council, all things legal, tax. They have a, a tax arm that we work with to make sure we're compliant with the IRS tax requirements. Mr. Donahue. Thanks, thanks, Ken. Members of the committee, uh, happy to be here today. It's our great pleasure to serve as Bond Council to the coordinating board. Uh, just a couple high-level notes about the resolution that will be on the agenda tomorrow, uh, and I'm certainly available for questions as well. But uh, the, the important thing about the resolution is this is the official action of the board authorizing the bonds. Uh, the, you will be delegating to either the commissioner or to Ken as CFO the, the ability to lock in the final pricing terms of the bonds. This is a market timing mechanism that's available to a lot of sophisticated issuers, and according to board, has used this traditionally to price bonds so that you can price your bonds around optimal market conditions rather than your quarterly meeting dates. So uh, with that said, the bonds are uh, sub subject to a couple of parameters, uh, most specifically the, the principal amount parameter. Uh, it, it would be the $200 million for the new money and then the $87,265,000 for the refunding, which is the par amount of the bonds that we would be looking at taking out, the 2010 bonds. You, you would be able to price the bonds uh, either together or separately, depending on market conditions. You have the flexibility under the resolution to issue these bonds any time in the next year, which is the maximum that the state law will allow you as far as the delegation timing. Uh, we have some timing requirements on the IRS side. Unfortunately, we were not able to lock in those 20 percent or the, the, the yeah, 21 percent savings today. We earliest we could fund that would be uh, around May or so. So we, we'll have to wait on that. But we can get the authorizations in place. Now, this, this will give us the ability to apply to the Bond Review Board uh, for their certain approvals that we have to get in order to issue the bonds tax, on a tax exempt basis. We have to get what's called volume cap. They're considered private activity bonds by the Internal Revenue Code, and the, uh, the Bond Review Board uh, allocates that out. And we'll, this will allow us, have, taking this official action now, will allow us to get those authorizations in and get the, those, those things locked up so that we have those approvals in place when we're ready to go uh, later this year. So uh, Lee mentioned that uh, the, the competitive sale basis, the resolution allows you to do competitive or negotiation, negotiated should market conditions change, but uh, traditionally we, we always do competitive, but you have the flexibility under the resolution to determine the sale type at the time based on market conditions. Um, and um, I think that's everything I really wanted to touch on. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to go through anything in any more detail. Any questions, Mr. Chairman? Okay, so um, I, I like your, your understatement. A bad result, you know, to go asking the controller for, for money because we lost money on our bond. <laughs> anyway, but in that regard, it, it, when, when the new issue goes out, in other words, you get is it $200 million, the new issue? Uh, we'll request probably from the volume cap up to $200 million. Based on this year's loan demand, if we have any excess, could be $20 million. We may be around $150, $170 of actual bond sale. Okay, my question really has to do with matching that particular sale with, with the, 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 the loan interest rate that you charge. And that, so in other words, Give, give me, walk me through the timing. When do you get the money from the bond sale, and then when do you start l loaning the money to the to the uh, sure. uh, students? And and let me step back. You know, previously, last year, if you recall, we did not have Senate Bill fourteen seventy four in play that modified uh, Texas Government Code Chapter uh, uh, thirteen seventy two, which which governs the private activity bonds. We had to sell bonds in February. 
which we did this last February, as I mentioned, I showed the amount that we sold. The reason we had to do it in February to fund this academic year, which really starts in August, was because we only had 180 days from bond review board approval of the volume cap. That came soon in August, August 15th, we had to go what's called the collapse. Anyways, because of the statute and a lot of limitations, we were really hampered from being efficient, and it cost us about $4 million a year. By working with Senator Lucio's office and, and having that change to that government code, it allows us the flexibility now to request, uh, we, we have enough to request within the first tranche, which is typically for us January through about June, we'll have and hopefully get a submit a request in December, maybe the end of November here, and get approval in January. Bond Review Board can approve prior to that. And then we have uh, 200, um, 210 days from that point to close, which will take us into July. So going through your scenario, we'll close in July, all indications probably around July 15th, somewhere around mid-July, and that money will come in, let's say it's $170 million, and that money will start being dispersed out around uh, about mid-August time frame. Okay, Maybe so even a little earlier, as students start the next academic year. Right, so no money goes out until you know your cost of capital, basically. So, it, so you reset the interest rate on each kind of annual tranche, so, so that so that you're able to figure out cost of capital versus interest rate, you know, is, and then factor in default. That is correct. And the, the IRS has a uh, because they're tax exempt. We have uh, one of the IRS requirements, not only the utilization uh, utilization of the particular funds, FB for student loans, et cetera, and the type. We also can't. I'll say this in in layman terms: we can't make too much money on these. They're tax exempt. The federal government's foregoing tax revenue, so the state us can't. We we can't set a ten percent rate, and we sold the bonds for three percent. We can only have a 2% differential. We've typically been below that, so you're right. We have an, we do, we perform an analysis. It's specific to each bond series. So when the mm. IRS looks at this, it's discrete to each bond series and the loan. So we have to segregate the loans issued for this from these bond funds and, and have those discreetly managed in its own bucket, if you will. And then we know the bonds and, and that bucket, and we have to keep those two separate. From that standpoint, we'll do an analysis and we'll look at that. We'll, we'll know what our, our true interest cost is on, on these bonds, if, if you, you know, uh, working capital, if you will. We'll look at uh, market conditions. We'll also look at what we have in savings. So we, we can project out what maybe we'll have in savings based on these other bond sales and do we want to utilize some of those, which we did this last series, to help subsidize the interest rate. So maybe we'll only have a 1% differential on it versus a full 2% because we, we may not need the 2%. We'll have plenty of uh, working capital that's coming in over time to be able to meet our uh, debt service needs in the future. Right, and you'll look at credit score and default rate historically. Anyway, but it, but Absolutely. It, but that, that, that single, that, that matching of funding and then loans that, that helps everybody. That, that, that reduces absolutely does. a lot of risk. And, and, and we do that, and, and, and we, you know, we, we, we'll discuss with the commissioner our recommendation for an interest rate, the rationalization for it, um, you know, how we came about it. Um, we, we do look at credit scores, and I may be having another discussion about that in the future. If you recall, the credit score years ago, uh, I came into this role about five years ago, was I think 590 was the low end of it, which is subprime. Uh, I recommended to the board we bring it up to 650. We did that. Previously, prior to it being down at 590, it was actually at 720 on the low range. Um, credit score does predict default, and, and you absolutely can see that there is higher delinquency, higher default on the lower credit score. So we are seeing that. We do ca capture credit score in the lo loan system we implemented four years ago. We just don't have enough runway to have specific data. Some students are still in school, not paying us, et cetera. And once we get more data, we'll be able to see more uh, of what the, what the true implications are to say, what is that sweet spot? Is it maybe 700 for a recommendation? Do we stay at 650, 680? And it was, but we do, we do monitor that. We just don't have good three years of repayment data to be able to uh, show the board yet more empirical data behind a potential change in the, in the credit score.
Well, just with that uncertainty, don't set the interest rate too low. That's my message. All right, thank you. What, uh, Mr. Martin, what is the median? Oh, no. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Schwartz. Yes, thank you. Um, question on, on the timing. Uh, given how unpredictable the markets have been, eight months seems like a really long time from now. Is there a process just of coming back to inform us of different changes in the market condition that might affect this um, significantly? Absolutely. Uh, typically in the past, what we've done is we've done a post review. So we'd have the resolution, we'd have the bond sale, and then typically at the, the follow on meeting would come, I would come and I would present what the results of that bond sale were. We absolutely can come back because as I, as I mentioned, the reason we absolutely will need money for new loan money for loans, but from a refunding standpoint, we don't know. We may come back and say we didn't do it because if, if the interest on in the market is higher than the interest on the bonds, it's just like a house and refinancing. You're not going to do it. Um, yeah, we, we have seen, uh, you know, you all and us have seen the market uh, be really uh, – challenging at times to predict. Uh, the, the political environment has been something that we haven't seen in quite some time. Uh, it, it's difficult to predict what's going to come out, all the different types of things from impeachment to this and that. How, how is that going to affect the market? We don't know. We know that we're in an unprecedented uh, growth period for the economy. We're, we're past the longest period since post-World War II of expansion. Uh, it's not a huge expansion, but 2 percent or so, 1.6 to 2 percent each year. When's the next recession? Uh, you know, even Harvard graduates and the best economists out there cannot predict that. Um, don't know. We all know one thing. It's coming. We just don't know. Some predict in 2020. Some predict in 2021. Um, so, yes, ma'am, we, we absolutely will, will uh, continue to look at that. If, if for some reason we see market conditions swing wildly enough that uh, uh, we won't do the refunding, We'll, we'll bring that up, that, that we're calling it off, and, and we just don't see it being favorable, as Mr. Donner mentioned. There's really kind of a spread, because it does cost us, just like refinancing your mortgage, there's some, there's some costs up front. So over time, you want to reap those back and, and more. We want to do the same. But the new money is a challenging. We, we, because of the constraint of the way the statute was written before, um, we came up to, this was uh, about two years ago, I think it was 2016, a situation where we were going to market and we had to sell. We had, otherwise, our authorization from the bond review board would expire and we wouldn't be able to get it back and we wouldn't have money for students for the next academic year. And Trump was looking to rewrite the tax code. And he had a Senate version, a House version. There was one version that was going to eliminate private activity bonds, the very bonds we're, we're utilizing. And uh, that was an, and then there were many other items and interest rates are going up and down and they're going up because they thought that, that Trump was going to revitalize the economy and stimulate with tax cuts, et cetera. And uh, we made the decision. We looked at the risk of going to January, early February, and it, the, the risk that we wouldn't potentially have bonding authority if private activity bonds from the federal level went away. We would lose that authority and we, we'd be stuck and not being able to issue loans to students or do we uh, sell in December. So we, we sold as late as possible in December, but uh, unfortunately <clears throat> caught what was called the Trump bump and the market and interest rates are going up expecting the economy to expand. About six months later, it all went back to normal. And we got stuck in that. But that was the inflexibility we had then. Now we have flexibility. Once we get authority from the Bond Review Board, once we uh, get approval from the Bond Review Board, we do have to go to the Bond Review Board to get their approval. Uh, the Office of Attorney General approves the final terms and conditions of the sale once we post sale, once we have uh, gone to market. So there are still other hoops we have to jump through. But if we really saw the market conditions are, are going sour, the new money we may have to launch earlier. And we have to balance the fact that um, I always use this analogy. It's like buying a house, but you're not going to move into it until August, but you're going to secure your mortgage in March and start paying interest. You know, you'd only do that in really extreme conditions because of that cost of that interest and you don't have the asset yet. Um, but we'd have to evaluate that. Would it be more beneficial? And, and we certainly do that. Okay. Any other questions? All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, do we, do I have a motion to adopt a resolution authorizing the issuance of the state of Texas college student loan bonds in one or more series and delegation of the authority for the administration and approval of the activities necessary to complete the sale of the private activity bonds. Aye. A motion from Mr. Anwar, 
I'll second. Second by the chairman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing or seeing no opposition, motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes. You did bring up a, a factor, I think Mr. Donahue did, on the uh, review of that would be, would it be with Ken or with a commissioner? Would be the commissioner I would recommend. Would you agree, Chairman Stedman? Yeah, well, that's just what it says. The commissioner yeah. sets the, uh, agrees to the rate. Right. right, no, but I, I'd heard something about either him or Ken, so I just wanted to make sure that I heard someone in the panel In terms of setting that. the interest rate? No, not the, setting the rate. Um, I mean, signing off on the anything before it comes back to the board. Did I well, hear that? Was well, it, let, me, let me maybe provide. What does the motion say? <laughs> or, or the, or the, yeah. The what resolution approved. The motion. The, re the resolution provides that either either the commissioner or the CFO are authorized to set the final terms of the bonds. So it's usually good to have more than one person. If someone is unavailable at the time the bonds are to be priced. But that's that's the delegation that we've used and, previously. And that's just for the bond sale. Yes. So right. that's just we, we go competitive. We take the lowest rate. So last time we had I think eleven uh, uh, that registered, ten that that went through, and and we accepted the lowest rate. And lock that in from an interest rate now we do the analysis now we know what our starting point is from cost right. and now we do the analysis on the loans we absolutely go to the commissioner to work with the interest rate how we'll set the interest rate etc right. as That's it relates to the right. students correct right I just yes. want to verify correct. that thank you all right thank you thank you gentlemen uh, agenda item number six internal audit uh, the first item under internal audit is agenda item 6a Report of the External Quality Assurance Review of Internal Audit and Compliance Monitoring. This item does not require any action. With us is Mr. Mark Pell, Director of Internal Audit and Compliance. Mr. Paul is, uh, Mr. Mayard, I think, is on the, is it Mr. Tarr that's on the phone? Okay. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Paul Mayard, Assistant Director of Internal Audit and Compliance, and Mr. Richard Tarr, Consulting Specializing and quality assurance reviews of the internal audit departments will be will present this item and be available for question. Mr. Tarr is joining us via conference call. Mr. Tarr, are you on the line? I am, sir. Good afternoon Thank to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, Mr. Pell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Uh, let me provide a, a bit of brief context um, on this item before uh, turning it over to Mr. Tarr. Um, Every three years, internal audit is required by state law and auditing standards to undergo what's called an external quality assurance review. Um, this is where an experienced practitioner who's independent of the coordinating board, they come in and they take a look at our, at our audit work. Um, for us, that's internal audit as well as compliance monitoring, so th both of those functions. And they do an evaluation um, of our compliance with professional standards. Um, and then they also look for areas uh, uh, where they can suggest uh, improvements that we can uh, take a look at. So you have a final report that should be um, at your places. It should look something like this. Yes. Um, this is the report uh, from Mr. Tarr. Um, it's recently issued. And, um, and with that, um, I will ask Mr. Tarr to Tell us a bit about his experience and qualifications, and then um, do a quick presentation of uh, the results of the review. Mr. Tarr? Yes, thank you. Uh, I, my name is Richard Tarr, uh, along with uh, uh, Elizabeth Stepp, who worked with me on the review team. Uh, she is the uh, uh, retired audit director from the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Uh, together, we came. Uh, into Austin, and we uh, conducted a review uh, for the purpose of determining whether or not the internal audit activity at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board is in compliance with professional standards. There are some 10 general standards and some 42 specific standards that we evaluated as part of our review process to determine whether or not there was sufficient evidence that uh, that um, the activity is following those professional standards. Now, these standards are recognized internationally. Uh, Texas is one of about a handful, probably about a dozen states, that has a state law that requires that uh, agencies and universities have internal audit departments and that they must 
demonstrate that they are following these professional standards. Uh, and so that is a requirement that must be uh, met with every three years. Uh, I've done about, I've been doing this for longer than I like to admit, but I've been doing this for about 30 years. I've done about 150 uh, peer reviews or quality assurance reviews, uh, both in, uh, in the public and private sector of the economy. Um, and so I came in along with uh, Elizabeth, and uh, we conducted the interviews of some key individuals, including the, your previous commissioner, uh, your uh, chair, Mr. Stedman at the time, and, uh, uh, and uh, internal audit staff. Uh, along with that, we reviewed several sets of work papers and other documentation that was there uh, evidencing what was being done in the way of planning, executing, and reporting on audit work, um, along with uh, 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 a confidential survey that was sent to uh, about a dozen of the if you will, audit customers of the internal audit activity uh, uh, in the last year, uh, trying to gauge their satisfaction with whether or not the services they received and the audit work that was conducted at their various institutions uh, provided any value and provided any uh, assurance that they were in compliance and doing what was expected of them with regards to uh, their dealings with the uh, Higher Education Coordinating Board. Uh, interestingly enough, 99% uh, of the responders to that confidential survey uh, gave the internal audit activity at your agency a 99% uh, positive response. Uh, that means that 99% of the respondents um, and of the questions that were asked of them during the survey uh, responded either with uh, excellent or good as their response, uh, that's a response rate I very seldom see. Usually I see a response rate somewhere down in the high 80s or low 90s. So that's impressive that uh, the customers of the internal audit services uh, are seeing value in the work that's being conducted uh, and the reviews that are being done by the internal audit staff. Uh, the objective overall of this review is twofold. One, to determine that the internal audit activity and the staff are following professional standards, and clearly they are. Uh, the other uh, objective is to identify where there may be opportunities to improve the internal audit process. Uh, uh, in the report, we made a couple of recommendations uh, not to correct any deficiencies in in compliance with the professional standards, but some ideas that um, uh, Elizabeth and I thought might be of benefit. One was to uh, to, to uh, change the alignment of the direct supervision of the staff, and the other was to provide agency operations committee and the commissioner a periodic report on the status of all the audit recommendations that have come out of all the audit projects. Um, the opinion of the review team was that um, the internal audit activity at the uh, Texas Higher, uh, Higher Education Coordinating Agency uh, clearly is in compliance with and adhering to the professional standards. Uh, the best uh, opinion we can give under the guidance from the Institute of Internal Auditors is generally complies, and that's the opinion that we have communicated in the context of the report that I think you have in front of you. Um, can I answer any questions? Uh, well, thank you very uh, much, uh, 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 Mr. Tarr. Any questions for either Mr. Pell or Mr. Tarr? Mr. Chairman? So on, on the recommendation uh, to, to have a single person in your group sort of uh, spearhead the audit, then that person reports to you, right? Do you have the resources to do that, or? We did. We made some uh, some adjustments with our existing resources, and so um, so we now have an assistant director position. And in a couple of agenda items, I'll bring him up and introduce him. So yes, we've already acted on it, and uh, and it's going to be very beneficial. Good, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Tarr? Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Pell. Uh, he's going to continue with Mr. Parr. Thank you for being on the line. We appreciate your work and uh, and your uh, report to the committee. One last comment, if I might. Uh, yes. I was impressed with the uh, with the strong support the committee has provided to the internal audit 
function and activity at the agency. I hope that uh, uh, continues to be uh, uh, to be the case going forward. Uh, you now have a new chairman. I hope that new chairman sees the value that having a strong, well-supported uh, internal audit activity will bring to the agency. Well, that uh, new chairman that is that new chairman is absolutely outstanding. So I just want you to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I say so myself. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate those kind words, and uh, uh, we look forward to working with you again soon. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, all and right. you all have a good, good day. Thank you, you as well. Thank you so much. Uh, right agenda now. item 6B is the audit report on performance measures at the Higher Education Coordinating Board by the Texas State Auditor's Office. This item does not require any action. Uh, we have Mr. Michael Clayton, Audit Manager, and Mr. Greg Adams, Project Manager uh, from the S Texas State Auditor's Office. We'll present this item and be available uh, to answer questions. Gentlemen. Thank you. At the Higher Ed Education Coordinating Board, uh, with me today, I've got Greg Adams, who is a project manager for our office and was a project manager on that audit uh, at the Performance Measures at Higher Ed Coordinating Board. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to say thank you all for giving us some time to listen to the results of our audit. We do appreciate that. To also thank Mark and all the other staff here who were very helpful during the course of our engagement. It's a lot of extra work for the staff when we come in and do an audit on top of what they do every day, and so we do appreciate their assistance with this. Uh, because we couldn't have gotten it completed timely if we, if we hadn't gotten that. So, um, <clears throat> uh, Ultimately, uh, higher education institutions report data to the Higher Ed Coordinating Board, who then uses that data to calculate their own internal performance, or certain of their internal performance measures that they report in the Automated Budget and Evaluation System of Texas, or ABEST. Uh, Y'all may have seen that in the past. It's kind of an unusual structure. Uh, most entities are reporting based on data that they have in-house, not data that comes from external sources. So I think that in itself uh, presents some unique challenges for y'all guys in some respects uh, and additional work. Uh, based on our results of our audit, uh, we, we determined that the five measures that we tested were certified with qualification. Uh, and certainly uh, we thought they were accurate, but we felt like there were some places where some controls around those could be improved. It can, to ensure that they're continuing being accurate moving forward. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Greg to get in some more of the, the specific measures and, and the specific results of that testing. So, Good afternoon, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair, mm -hmm. members. My name is Greg Adams. I was the project manager on the audit. And first of all, I'd like to talk about the five measures that we audited. We audited the percentage of university students graduating in four Thank years. You the percentage of university students graduating within six years, the number of master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, associate degrees, and certificates awarded, the percentage of first-year medical residents headcount to Texas medical school graduates, and the number of students receiving Texas grants. I'll be discussing the control issues that resulted in all five performance measures being certified with qualification. Those measures fall into three categories. First of all, policies and procedures. The number of students receiving Texas grants was the only one of the five measures with policies and procedures that documented the calculation methodology. The rest did not have those. The second area is data review. Although the board asserted that it performed reviews of its calculations of performance measures and the performance measures prior to data entry into ABEST, auditors could not verify that the reviews occurred due to a lack of documentation. Additionally, the board did not have documented policies and procedures for those data review processes. Third and final area is data verification. As Michael said, all of your data, all the data you use for the performance measures comes from external organizations. And four of the, four of the five audited performance measures rely primarily on data that the institution self-reported to the board. The board should strengthen controls and ensure it receives all records transmitted by the institutions. That concludes our prepared testimony, but we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. 
Anyone have any question for either Mr. Clayton or Mr. Adams? Mr. Stonewall. All this data is reported to you. Is it through any computers or anything that you can instantly get all the data without going through requesting paper trail? For, for us, are you talking about for us doing the audit itself? Yes. Um, we were, we did have to work with your staff, but we had ver we have very high confidence that the data we the data that we received is the data that you all received too. One of the one of the most important parts of our audits is ensuring data integrity of the of what we receive. Does that answer your question, sir? Well, um, you know, the time delay in the audit versus the real progress made. So let me give you a real life example in our oil business. So back in the old days, when I first got out of college, every information will tri trickle through, and it takes days before we get it. But now, instantly, if we are drilling a well, we want to know what's going on. We log on the computer, we have instant data, cost, what kind of technical difficulties we have. Before we had to wait, and by the time it's all done, there's wastage of time and money on it. So I just wondering, is there any way all this data can be computerized so it can be readily available instead of going back auditing a year later and say, well, this money was not rightly used or, you know, just more efficient way of doing business? I, th I think that for most of the data that we looked at, that would be very difficult because it's enrollment data and it has to be, first of all, vetted at the institution level and then provided to you all. And so with the exception of the Texas grants data, which is something that your folks are able to keep track of a little more easily. I would say that's very difficult here. Also, the sheer number of institutions that supply some of this data. You know, and I think I'll add to that. You know, the data is, most of it is automated. However, you are, again, re re you know, you're kind of relying on third parties to report data. So, uh, unfortunately, as you know, the, you know, the university, uh, some people are reporting things a little bit more timely than other people. Uh, and so that creates some issues, and especially when you look at enrollment data, because that changes throughout the course of a year, you know, with students drop, students add. Uh, so that's always changing data. So, you know, theoretically, you do have the data you could do some real-time analysis on. Uh, we usually typically pick a point in time where we know all the data is there and go back and look at that data. And for this, we looked at specifically. I understand. Flight. Well, I don't know whether we have it readily available or not. Um, maybe Linda can verify it or not, but what I have seen, if the data is readily available, so like there is some cases the uh, funds were misappropriated and it took years to find out. So if we have it readily available on the line and we can review it, it's just more efficient way of doing business. Well, some data, I guess that's what I would qualify based on what we looked at. I mean, we're talking mainly about enrollment data because that drove most of the performance measures we looked at as part of this audit, so. Any other question for these gentlemen? Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Next item is uh, agenda item 6C, post payment audit report for the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board by the Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts. This item does not require any action. We'll have Mr. Michael Apperly, Manager of Statewide Fiscal Oversight, Fiscal Management at the Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts will present this item and be available for questions. Mr. Apperly. Hi, how are you? Thanks, Mr. Apperly. No, I'm sorry. For Fiscal Management's expenditure audit section with the Comptroller's Office. Okay, thank uh, you, Mr. Hardenstein. Okay. Uh, with me is Anna Calzada, who is the lead auditor for the audit of the Higher Education Coordinating Board. Thank you both. We issued our most recent audit of the <coughs> board on August 8, 2019. We reviewed several key areas related to the board's expenditures uh, processed through the Comptroller's accounting systems, including a review of the board's uh, payroll, purchase, and travel transactions. We also reviewed several contracts and their associated payments and reviewed the controls the board has in place over its expenditure processing. Overall, we were very pleased with the results of the audit. 
The only findings in the audit report were in the purchase and procurement sample and in our review of the internal control structure. The first finding related to one contract having insufficient contract terms. The uh, request for, for proposal, original contract, and the amendment did not clearly list the contract deliverables and budget information, making it unclear as to what services were being performed. The contract did not include a list of the program partic participants. While the amendment did list the participants, it was not clear as to whether those were existing or new participants. And finally, there was no budget or cost estimate associated with the amendment's increased contract amount. The board has already updated its procurement and contract management handbook and provided training to its staff to address this issue. Our second finding related to one duplicate payment being issued by the board. This was identified from a separate report we ran listing potential duplicate payments. The board has already received a reimbursement from the vendor and has enhanced its procedures to identify duplicate invoices before payment. The final finding related to having one employee with the capability to approve paper vouchers and pick up warrants from the comptroller's office. This allowed for the potential for that employee to process a paper voucher and pick the warrant from that voucher up without any oversight by another board employee. We do not find any, any instances of any documents being processed without oversight, and the board has already removed the ability to pick up warrants from this employee. Thank you for your time. We'll be happy to answer any questions about the report you may have. So, in terms of the, this employee who had that ability but now does, doesn't have it, what, what transpired that caused that to no longer be the case? It was the way uh, your staff set the employee up with the security. They had the, to do these two separate functions that combined gave the potential to process a payment to, on paper, process a paper voucher and pick it up, pick the warrant up for the voucher without any other individual having oversight over that. And they can't do that any longer, as that's, I, that's I understand. Right. That's right. They okay. took that authority away, so it cannot happen anymore. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Hornstein? All right. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the last item on the internal audit is 6D, update on internal audit reports and activities. This item does not require any action. Mr. Mark Pell, Director of Internal Audit and Compliance, and uh, Mr. Paul Mayer, Assistant Director of Internal Audit and Compliance, will present this item to the committee and be available to answer questions. Uh, Mr. Pell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As promised, I'd like to introduce uh, Paul Mayer as uh, Assistant Director. We did, um, as I indicated, some reorganization in response to the Quality Assurance Review, and very happy to have his assistance. Um, uh, and working through um, uh, some of the quality control aspects of our of our work. And um, with that said, I'd like to ask Mr. Mayor to um, to take this agenda item. Thanks, Mark. Board uh, members, we completed four internal audit projects since the last July AOC meeting. The four final reports are in your packet, and there's a fifth report, which is actually a compilation of other previous issued reports and documents. Um, that is also included, and I'll cover that compilation report in a moment after the other four. First, there are two projects resulting in no findings. First, a follow-up audit of a physician education loan re repayment program. This follow-up confirmed that all seven prior recommendations have been completed with no recommendations outstanding. Second, a complaint uh, regarding alleged improper admissions uh, practices at Texas Southern University. This complaint originated from an anonymous online submission alleging that Texas Southern University tried to increase enrollment by encouraging staff to admit all students, irrespective of whether the student met admission requirements. We worked with Texas Southern's internal audit department, and they investigated the complaint and issued a confidential report. That report found that uh, the allegation was not substantiated. We reviewed the report and were satisfied with the work on the project that they did and closed the complaint as unsubstantiated. There are two other reports that are in your packet that have findings and recommendations. The first report with recommendations is the review of scholarship programs with one recommendation. That recommendation uh, was to improve the agency website and the College for, All Access, uh, College for All Texans website to better organize and display information for our stakeholders regarding scholarship programs. 
The second report with recommendations is the review of selected security awareness practices, and there were two findings. The key finding in that report um, was the need to comply with agency policy to protect information by locking unattended computer terminals. For both the scholarship and security projects, a management response is included in the report to provide corrective actions, and we'll be following up on these uh, reports at a future date. Lastly, the compilation report I referred to earlier. The State Audit Auditor's Office requires an annual activity report for all internal audit shops in Texas. This report is included in your materials and has documents that this committee has already <coughs> approved before, such as our internal audit plan and our external quality assurance review that we just discussed earlier today. We'll be sending these reports to the SAO by the November 1st deadline. Thank you. That concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might any have. Any questions for Mr. Mayor or uh, Mr. P Mr. Pale? Seeing no hands, thank you, gentlemen. Next will be uh, on the agenda is item 7A, update on compliance monitoring reports and activities. This item does not require any action. Again, Mr. Pell and Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. We completed six projects since the prior meeting in July and each of the reports are included in your materials. I'm pleased to report that all six engagements had no reportable findings or recommendations. Um, so these reports covered formula funding, data integrity at five institutions. And then there was the sixth report was uh, the TEOG uh, program compliance at, um, at a member of the Alamo Community College District um, with no findings. For our new board member and, uh, and commissioner, I uh, wanted to briefly touch on what our formula funding engagements entail at, at a high level. Um, what we do is we, we start with an assessment of the fundamental controls over an institution's student information system. So that's the system that's harboring the data, the enrollment information um, that is so important for decision-making purposes. So what we look at is we want to make sure that, um, that there's not an ability to make unauthorized changes to that information or that when that information is changed that we can see who made the change, the date, the time so forth. Um, we look at, um, at permission levels to make sure that uh, only the people that should have access to be able to make those changes um, are able to, um, to modify that, that type of data. So once we um, are able to establish that we can rely upon um, on those information system controls, then we're able to conduct the remainder of the work, which <coughs> is looking then at that enrollment information, tracing it back to uh, to source documents, checking um, comparable pieces of information to make sure that it is in fact comparable, like for instance looking at academic transcripts of a particular student to make sure that what the institution reported as classwork is actually reflected on that institution, on that student's academic um, uh, work record. So, um, so that's really kind of the, the structure of how we go about these reviews. Um, um, so there's a lot of work that goes into actually getting it to the point of being able to say that there's, um, there's a no findings report, but we certainly are working with the institutions to talk to them about the importance of information security. Um, we've put out a statewide uh, memo under Dr. Paredes prior to his, um, prior to his departure um, outlining the requirements and, and the critical need for, um, for protecting the information because that certainly uh, positions us to be able to conduct our work, but more importantly, um, you know, protects the information that um, that everyone is relying on, upon for making informed decisions. So, just a little bit about those types of projects. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have um, about our reports. Thank you, gentlemen. Any questions for Mr. Mayor or Mr. Pale? Mr. Chairman, I, I get. I've got a question. It, it's a the audit presentation before by, I guess, the controller. Yes. Yes. There were two of them. Anyway, the, the, one, the one that audits the data that you get from external sources, that would be an example, like formula funding or, or student enrollment data. Correct. It, I mean, so you get it, but, but this data verification, all that stuff, I mean, how can you, other than this audit you just did, how can you verify the data that somebody else gives you? Well, 
actually, um, Dr. Gardner and Julie Eklund, Dr. Eklund, that they have processes within the agency um, and a rather elaborate process to go about um, scrubbing that data to, to work with the institutions in a back and forth kind of manner. So they're not able to actually ultimately accept that information until a whole host of edit checks and, oh, and reasonableness checks and things like that are, are met. Um, so there's some programmed features um, that are critical. Yeah. Right. Okay. I think, though, that one of the findings was to document better those processes for, for collecting that data, correct? Yes. Uh, uh, you know, and, and there they're talking about within the agency the reviews that are being done um, to ensure that everything is complete, to ensure that our own internal calculations of performance measures are are double checked um, to ensure that they're accurate, things like that, that, that those verifications and approvals that those are, are maintained. Okay. Yes. So in general, if there was either sloppiness or um, intentional uh, distortion of data, you're, you're convinced that, in other words, if the data is all once it's scrubbed down, it looks really good and complete and well organized. The chances are, it's accurate, right? I mean, are, are, you, you think those processes are, are are good internally with the agency? Yes, um, with a caveat. You know, from an audit standpoint, uh, the information is only as good as the source from which it originates, and so that's why our function is vital to sure. be able to actually because. Because Dr. Eklund is not able to go out to those institutions and, and look at their controls over their student information systems and, you know, kick the tires and make sure that everything looks appropriate. Um, and so that's where we step in from a risk basis and, and we do that, um, provide that level of assurance. So it's kind of, it's really a marriage of these internal processes and, and con edit, ch edit checks and controls as well as us going out and verifying is the information that they are feeding into these systems, um, making sure that that looks appropriate. Yeah, gotcha, thanks. I think another good thing is, um, although you, you had a complaint that was uh, checked and uh, kind of cleared, that's always a good sign of people knowing where to complain and having a process that's protected to make sure that complaints get vetted without retaliation, I would hope. Um, so, you know, from an audit perspective, it's just always good to to get a complaint, make sure that process works, and and clear things to have other other ways to identify the problems if they're out there. Sure, and we have a you know we have a uh, an email way that they can submit that um, to my attention, and then um, the state auditor's office has a statewide hotline. We have a link to that on the agency's website, um, which is statutorily required, um, but it makes good sense. And then the state auditor's office, oftentimes when they get those complaints and they're higher education related, they refer those to us and then we um, look into them. So yeah, it's, it's a good process. Any other questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. All right. The next item is, uh, uh, says executive session, but I don't think we're going to have one. Is that correct? All right. Then that gets us to adjournment. Uh, this concludes the Agency Operation Committee meeting. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. He hearing and seeing no objection, we are adjour adjourned. <laughs> How are you? All right. Good to see you. How was the game? Did you enjoy it? Oh, I, oh it was fabulous. Mm -hmm. oh, you didn't come to the last game, they won. So yeah, yeah. I, in, in,